if somebody were to come up to you today and ask you the question, why should I trust the Bible? What would you say? Two weeks ago, uh, a world record was set by a woman named Dorothy Hoffner. She became the oldest person ever to jump out of a plane. At 104 years old, Dorothy Hoffner decided to go skydiving for the very first time, and they caught it on video. So I wanted us to enjoy that together. Here it is. What a shot. That's fantastic. Uh, 104 years old. That's amazing. Uh, but it was in watching this video this last week that I realized that Dorothy Hoffner and I have something in common. Uh, see, Dorothy Hoffner is from Chicago, and I just spent the last 15 years of my life there. And apparently, where she decided to go skydiving was the same place that I had decided to go skydiving when I went. So we've actually jumped out of the same plane. And it's a day that I remember vividly. Uh, we show up to this place, my buddy and I, and uh, it's not exactly a lot to look at. And the first thing we're asked to do is sign approximately 147 pages of waivers. Very comforting. All right. And then we are each paired with an instructor who we will be harnessed to for the duration of our time. And my instructor comes up and shakes my hand. He's a lot younger than I prefer him to be. Uh, and he tries to give me assurance that he's been doing this for well over two months. So here we go. Uh, we're in this together now. And they then proceed to give us bicycle helmets, uh, which I'm told do a whole lot uh, when you hit the ground at 120 miles per hour. And so here I am with my bicycle helmet and my instructor. We get on the plane and begin our ascent up to 10,000 feet. And about halfway up on this ride, I look over, and my buddy is strapped to his instructor who's behind him, and I notice his instructor is doing something odd. Uh, his instructor keeps checking the straps on my friend and then leaning back and doing this crossing his fingers and closing his eyes. And he just does this over and over again. And um, I suddenly realized I may have made the worst mistake of my life uh, going on this trip. And my friend, uh, who's strapped to the front of him, uh, has no idea what's going on behind him. And he looks over at me with this new, very concerned look on my face. And he goes, don't worry, dude, this is going to be great. OK, fantastic. So fast forward a couple minutes. Uh, spoiler alert, I did not die that day. Okay, I'm doing great, all right? But there was one casualty that day, and that was the foot-long Subway sandwich that I decided to slam down mere minutes before taking off. And so we make our way to the ground after too many spins and twirls, and my instructor goes, we did it! And I decide to thank him by painting his shoes with my lunch. So I learned two valuable lessons that day. Number one, never eat a 12-inch sandwich if you plan on being more than 12 inches above the ground. And second, it's important that what we are trusting in is trustworthy. If you've been around the bridge for any period of time, you know that when it comes to what we teach and what we believe, we don't just teach and believe anything. When it comes to what we teach, what we believe, we always ask the question, where is it written in the Bible? Uh, this was sort of the cry of the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, which held scripture as the ultimate authority for faith and practice for the Christian. So that raises the question, why then should we trust this Bible that we say we are looking to for every piece of guidance as we live, about, live our life? Why should we trust the Bible? So back to our question from the top. If somebody were to come up to you and ask you today, you know, the Bible is just a man-made book. It's really old. It's been copied century after century. And its contents were sort of hand-selected by a bunch of powerful men for the purposes of manipulating the masses. Why on earth should I trust the Bible? How would you respond? My hunch is, for many of us, we would have a hard time responding to a question like that. Many of us here today probably believe the Bible. But if we're pressed to explain why we believe the Bible, things might get really awkward really quickly. My hunch is that many of us go through life not really convinced that the Bible is true, but rather just hoping that the Bible is true. You might say that we have a sort of fingers crossed, eyes closed way of approaching scripture. But my hope today in our time together is that we would see that we actually have a really good reason to trust the Bible that we have been given. 
and that we would see an invitation to sort of an eyes wide open way of approaching scripture. A a sort of like, I've kicked the tires on this, it's tried and true, bet the farm on this kind of trust in the Bible. We are in a series called Counterculture, and we are walking through the New Testament letter of 2 Peter. Uh, Peter, if you didn't know, was one of Jesus' closest disciples and friends. And uh, if you don't know his story, it had a lot of ups and downs and some, quite frankly, pretty disappointing moments in following Jesus. So he's been through it, and he knows how to speak from experience. And this letter that we have, 2 Peter, is actually the last piece of writing that we have access to from Peter's life before he was, as tradition says, crucified upside down as a martyr for following Jesus. So last week, we looked at the first part of chapter one, and we are now gonna be in chapter two. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn to 2 Peter chapter one. We're gonna pick it up in verse 16. Peter says this, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Now, if you don't know what this is referring to, this is a scene from Jesus' ministry where he took three disciples, James, Peter, and John, up on a mountainside with him where he physically changed appearance. This is known as the transfiguration. And there appeared with him two figures, Moses and Elijah, which represent uh, really the entirety of the Old Testament. Moses is the one who gave the law, and Elijah representing the prophets. Taken together, they represent the entirety of the Old Testament. And then there's this voice from heaven saying, this is my son, talking about Jesus. With him, I'm well pleased. I love him. Listen to him. It's God the Father's way of saying, Jesus is the summation of all the scriptures. Listen to him. Verse 19, Peter says, we also, we also, talking about himself, have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you would do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, But prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here you can see that Peter is addressing accusations from skeptics that what he is saying, his testimony, the testimony of the apostles, and even the Jewish scriptures is not reliable. And Peter uses some of his final words to address this skepticism. By the way, this is not a new phenomenon. Peter's words are 2,000 years ago. Peter is saying, you can trust what I and the other apostles are saying. You can trust what the Jewish scriptures say. (coughs) Taken together, in today's lingo, Peter might say, you can trust your Bible. So today we're going to be looking at what support there is for this claim. Can we really trust the Bible that we have? Now, for some of you, this will be sort of refresher material, right? You've gone through this before. For many of us, though, this will be the very first time we've considered these issues or maybe even felt the freedom to consider these issues because we have assumed that to be a good Christian means to just believe what the Bible says and never question its contents, let alone question how the Bible actually became the Bible. But today, I want to provide a safe space for us to wrestle with these questions because they are good and right to wrestle with. So this is a safe place for you to bring your questions today. Now, as a caveat, this is not going to be a normal sermon. So usually we talk about stories in the Bible. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about the story of the Bible, this book that means so much to many of us. And if you are a skeptic today, maybe you don't believe a word of scripture, you're just here kind of because somebody brought you, you're just checking it out, I want to encourage you to lean in today, maybe to drop your guard a little bit and to wrestle with these afresh. I also want to encourage you, if you are a diehard believer, somebody's like, I believe every word of the Bible, not a problem for me, but you've never actually wrestled with why you believe scripture, I want to invite you to lean in as well, because I believe that we are called to have an intellectually robust faith, to have a reason for believing what we believe. So I think there's something for you today as well. So with that said, here's where we're going. We're going to cover three things. We're going to talk about the creation of the Bible. This is how the Bible came to be the copy process of the Bible. This is how the Bible came to us, the transmission throughout the centuries. And third, 
how the Bible came together. This is how we have the books that we have in the Bible and only those books. So with that said, whole books have been written about each of these topics. So I am not going to seek to answer every single question that you have, okay? Today is gonna be more of an introduction, sort of a 30,000 foot overview of each of these topics. And towards the end, I'm gonna point you towards some resources if you want to do a deeper dive. Sound good? All right, we're gonna cover a lot today, okay? So buckle up, here we go. First of all, the creation process of the Bible. This has to do with how the Bible came to us. First, we have to ask, ask this question, what is the Bible? Fair starting point? So for our purposes together, here's the definition of the Bible. The Bible is a unified library of fully divine, fully human words that all points to Jesus. So first, we're gonna kind of take that apart line by line. The Bible is a unified library. Do you know the Bible is actually not one book? It is a collection of 66 books across two different testaments, New Testament and Old Testament, with over 40 different authors that include prophets, scribes, king, fish, kings, fishermen, tax collectors, missionaries, priests, ranchers, shepherds, and more. It was written at different times over a period of 1,500 years from the 14th century BC to the 1st century AD. It was written in different places like Israel, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Asia Minor, Syria, and so on. It was written in different cultures, Canaanite, Egyptian, Babylonian, Persian, Roman, Greek, and in different languages, mostly Hebrew and Greek with a little Aramaic, Aramaic sprinkled in, and in different genres. So we have everything from historical narrative to epic poems, the worship songs, lament, law contracts, court rulings, liturgical instructions, architectural instructions, philosophical disputes, genealogical records, proverbial sayings, prophetic oracles, apocalyptic visions, letters, biographies, sermons, and even a little bit of erotic poetry. True story. So the Bible is a collection. It did not just drop out of the sky as a complete leather-bound set. It is a composite result of dozens of authors written, writing in dozens of genres across the span of 1,500 years. It is a library. And yet, it's a unified library. Okay, so I want to show you a picture. Uh, this is a chart of the different cross-references that there are in the Bible, places where a verse refers to another spot in the Bible. Did you know there are over 63,000 cross-references in the Bible? That's amazing. It is all very interconnected. So through all of its complexity and diversity, the Bible tells one story of creation, human rebellion, and God's rescue and redemption of humanity culminating in the finished work of Christ and the promise that Christ will one day soon return again to set everything right. Amen. So the Bible is unified. Further, the Bible is fully divine. Uh, this is not something that we just infer from the Bible. This is actually something the Bible says about itself. You know, from the beginning, our God has been a speaking God. Just three verses into the book of Genesis, we read, And God said, let there be light. And when God created people, he was in this habit of talking, conversing with the people that he created. And when God has a message for lots of different people, he almost always sends that through a human. And so from the beginning... Our God has been a speaking God. And the Bible captures the library of ways that God has spoken to his people throughout the century. So this is why Peter can say, no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Or as Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed. Some translations say inspired. So what does it mean for scripture to be God-breathed, to be inspired? Uh, here's what it doesn't mean. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's just beautiful. Like you might see a painting and be like, this is an inspired painting. It resonates with me. No. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm just inspired by reading the Bible. It's inspiring to me, even though it can mean that for sure. When we say that scripture is inspired, we mean that the very words of scripture come from God. They are God's words, not just God's ideas, God's very words. So the Bible is fully divine. But the Bible is also fully human. Okay, this will be a stretch for some of us. The Bible is God's message from humans, through humans, using human words. But how can a human sitting down, writing, something, produce something that's fully human and fully divine at the same time. That's a difficult concept to wrestle with. So what do we mean? 
that the Bible is fully human. Again, here's what it does not mean. It does not mean that the Bible was just dropped from the sky, okay? So this is uh, Mormonism, uh, right? We have like kind of golden tablets just emerging from God to Joseph Smith. Uh, this isn't God dictating uh, to people as they're quickly scribbling down God's thoughts, right? This is sort of uh, how the book of um, the Quran was produced from God according to the teachings of Islam. This is not God overriding the personalities or wills of the authors, like, like Paul was put into a trance and then he kind of snapped out of it and all of a sudden the book of Romans was there finished in front of him, right? That's not what we're talking about. The Bible being fully human means that it bears the marks of culture, the linguistic tendencies, and even like the personality quirks of each of its authors. So how does this work? How can a human put pen to paper and have their full personality be brought to bear with all of their history and their own tendencies and have the finished work be the very words of God? The short answer is, we don't really know, okay? So when we talk about being carried along by the Holy Spirit as we're writing, as uh, something is being God-breathed, th those, those phrases are just not given a lot of definition in Scripture. And so there's a lot of mystery here, to be sure. And to be clear, this is not saying that everything that these authors ever wrote was inspired by God. We're not saying that Paul's grocery list, right, should be included in Scripture. Rather, what we're saying is that the Spirit empowered specific instances where these authors sat down to write these texts that we have in the Bible, and these texts are the very words of God. So why is it important for us to, to reckon with not just the fact that these are fully divine words, but fully human words as well? See, many of us can fall into the temptation to think that something can only be divine if it doesn't have a natural explanation. And then we encounter the Bible, and it's got 40 different authors writing over 1,500 years from different parts of the world, and you can tell, right? So we have David sounding like David, and Habakkuk sounding like Habakkuk, and then Paul has his own sort of literary style and technique, and that's different from Mark. And this way of thinking about the Bible can make some of us feel very uncomfortable because we have this unspoken expectation that the Bible should be sort of neat and simple and tidy, but the Bible's not. It's complex. Yeah. It's sometimes even messy. Yeah. It's human. And this can make us antsy, right? Because we think uh, the, less, uh, the more human something is, the less divine it must be. Uh, as one person says, we tend to therefore polish off the human fingerprints of the Bible. But the Bible has human fingerprints from start to finish. It is thoroughly human from beginning to end. And friends, we should not be afraid of that. After all, God from the beginning has preferred to work through humans. Uh, when he creates the earth and he sets to rule over the earth, how does he do it? He takes two people, Adam and Eve, and he says, go, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. When God wants to develop the world, he uses farmers and carpenters and artists and scientists and city planners to do just that. And even when humans royally mess things up and God sets out to fix the world, he does it through a human, a fully divine human, Jesus. And so if we're having trouble with the idea that the words of the Bible are both fully divine and fully human, we have to remember that we worship a Savior who is both of those things fully at the same time. Amen. All right? Yeah. So that's what the Bible is, a unified library of fully divine, fully human words that all points to Jesus. That's what the Bible is and how it came to be. But the Bible's very old, if you haven't noticed, okay? And we have to then ask, how did it come to us from 2,000 years ago or more? This is where we get into the copy process, okay? The copy process. No preacher has ever read the Bible. Neither has any evangelical politician, neither has the Pope, neither have I, and neither have you. At best, we've all read a bad translation. A translation of translations of translations of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies, and so on, and so on. These words were written by a man named Kurt Eichenwald in a Newsweek article written in 2015 in which he is setting out to say we really cannot trust that the Bible that we hold today is anything like the original. So how true are these words from Kurt Eichenwald? Now, remember the Bible 
uh, came about as a process over 1,500 years with the last of these writings being written about 2,000 years ago. Uh, the original documents are written on things like papyrus and animal skin, and there was no in internet back then, remember, right? Uh, before internet days. So if you wanted to send something somewhere, uh, if you wanted to send a copy of the book of Exodus or the Gospel of John, a copy would have to be made. And these copies are called manuscripts, okay? Manuscripts. And uh, these manuscripts, of course, through use and over time, would wear out. And so new copies would have to be made. Now, this introduces a problem. Because when you copy something, errors can sneak in. So this introduces this question. Why should we trust that the Bible that we have today in any way resembles what it originally was? Or to put it very simply, even if God inspired John, and even if John wrote John, can we be sure that the John that we have is actually the John that John wrote? Pretty simple? <laughs> All right, so for the sake of time, to get into this question, we are going to just talk about the New Testament, okay? Uh, we'll point to some uh, kind of uh, materials that you can look at if you are interested in the Old Testament for the New Testament. Here are a few facts. Thousands of years have gone by between the time that the New Testament was written and today, yes? There are no surviving original copies of the New Testament. They call them autographs, the originals. Not one. And there are around 400,000 textual variants in the manuscripts that we do have. These are places where the manuscripts do not agree with each other. 400,000. So with all of that, why on earth should we believe that the Bible that we have today is anything like the original? Uh, the kind of classic illustration for this objection is the game of telephone. So I want to put up a, an illustration here. Uh, remember the game of telephone when you're a kid? You get in a line, right? And somebody at the front of the line comes up with a phrase, and then that phrase is whispered to the person next to them, and that person whispers the phrase to the next person, and uh, you get to the end of the line, and then you stop and you see how badly did the transmission process mess up this phrase, right? This is what people are saying when they say, the Bible is not reliable. The Bible that we have today can't be because of this long transmission line through the centuries. Here's the problem with this illustration when it comes to the Bible. First, telephone, if you remember, was actually designed to trip up the players. So you can only whisper, right? Make it kind of harder to hear. You can only say the thing once, right? And you cannot go and talk to people earlier in line. You can only rely on the person who's next to you, just before you, in line to get the phrase. This is not what the Bible's like. Uh, first of all, there was no whispering, okay? So the copy process often involved full teams of people who would check and recheck down to the most minute detail, number of characters even, before a copy was finalized. And unlike the game of telephone, where each person only has access to the person who's before them, we actually have access to manuscripts that are very, very close to the original authors. We don't have just a few copies to work with. In fact, I want to show you how the New Testament stacks up to other ancient writings at the time. So we've got a chart here. I want you to look at the number of copies to start, okay? So you've got the writings of Plato. We actually have seven copies of the writings of Plato. That's it. When it comes to Aristotle, a little better, at 49 copies to go on, cross-check amongst each other. Homer's Iliad fares much better at 643 copies, but look at the New Testament. This is just the Greek manuscripts at 5,600. This is a conservative estimate and doesn't even count the tens of thousands of other copies that we have in other languages. Okay? Next, I want us to see the gap in time between the time that it was written and the time of the earliest copy that we have. This is where we get to look at the gap in the kind of telephone game transmission. If the writings of Plato were around 400 BC, the earliest copy we have is 900, leaving a gap of 1,300 years without any transmission evidence. It's a long time. Aristotle, even worse, at 1450. Homer's Iliad, better, but still at 500 years. Again, the New Testament just blows ancient writings out of the water. Less than 100 years between the time of the copies that we have and the time of the original writing. So if we were to compare the New Testament to a game of telephone, instead of that neat little line of transmission, it actually looks more like this, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this, this is like going back in line and, and seeing that the first person didn't just communicate their message to one person, but told like 10 people, and finding that those people didn't just tell one person, but each told 10 more people. And then we get to go to the near the very front of the line. We don't have access to this person, no, but we have access to all of this. And imagine we get to go and interview 100 people 
and find out exactly what they said. That's a pretty different game of telephone, isn't it? So how about these 400,000 variants? That's a big and scary number, right? What do we make of those? First of all, it's important to say that that number 400,000 is so large because of the sheer number of copies of the New Testament that we have. We just showed you 5,600 copies, far more than any other ancient document. Now, if I were to tell you that I knew of a basketball player who missed 12,000 shots in the course of his career, you might go, wow, that's a pretty crummy basketball player. If I were to then tell you that basketball player is Michael Jordan, and the only reason he missed 12,000 shots is because he took over 24,000 in the course of his career, that changes the picture, doesn't it? So scale matters. The same is true with the Bible. The reason, primary reason, we have so many manuscript differences is just the sheer number of manuscripts that we have. But still, what do those differences mean? Okay, you'll see these uh, indicated in the footnote of your Bible, just so you know what to look for. I want to show you a picture. When you get to kind of the bottom of the page before the footnotes, you'll see this thing that says some manuscripts read or some manuscripts omit. Okay, that's what to look for when we're talking about these things. What kind of manuscript differences are there? Let me give you a few categories. The first category comprises 70% of all manuscript differences. And these are just spelling errors that have no bearing on the meaning of the text at all. 70%. Even if you recognize the error, it doesn't change the meaning at all. 70%. A second category is where there are errors and the meaning of the text is effective, but we can clearly see that it's not original. So one of my favorite examples of this is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul says, we were gentle among you. And then you have one manuscript that says, we were horses among you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As it turns out, the word for gentle and word for horse are actually pretty similar in the Greek, and you can see that there was a slip of the hand in one manuscript, and it's actually not what Paul meant. Uh, we can tell. Paul didn't mean we were horses. I certainly hope not, okay? One manuscript, it's a significant variant if it's true, but we can see that it's not true, okay? A third category is instances where we have multiple manuscripts attesting to the same difference, but it just doesn't affect the meaning. So a good example of this is where John is spelled with two N's instead of one. Or an instance where it says, the Lord said, and then it says, Jesus said. Okay, same difference. These are not things that we should be concerned with. Okay, here's my point. If you take just those three categories that we talked about, taken together, they account for 99.5% of textual variants. That's a lot. And even if you look at the remaining 0.5%, not one of them has any bearing on the kind of major doctrines of Christianity. So to use the telephone analogy one more time, imagine we were able to leave our place in line and go back to near the front of the line, interview 100 people who are within a few degrees of the original speaker, and 99% of those people say, Jenny drove her car from the school to the doctor's office. And then we have one person said, Jenny drove her van from the school to the doctor. We can be pretty sure of what the original message is. That's the game of telephone that we're dealing with. It's actually extremely reliable. 99% agreement and 100% agreement on all the doctrines that make Christianity what it is. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, hanging in there? This is gonna, okay. We, are, we have one more section left. You guys are doing fantastic. We're gonna talk about, we talked about the creation process, the copy process, and now we're gonna talk about the canon process. Some of you are like, I'm nerding out right now. Other of you, others of you are like, I can't wait for this to be over, okay. The canon process. This is how the Bible came together, okay. The definition of canon, in case that's a new word, this is spelled with one N in the middle, not like, like this is C-A-N-O-N. -N. It originally was a word that was uh, defined as a rod or measuring stick, and eventually it became uh, a term that was used for the body of literature that was considered authoritative in scripture, okay. Now, uh, regarding the Old Testament, uh, as we just said, there was a wide acceptance that amongst Jews at the time that the Jewish scriptures were the very words of God. We saw this, uh, uh, Jesus bought into this, Jews of his time uh, believe this. This is why you can see Jesus and other Jews throwing out references to Old Testament, uh, and it's widely accepted. This is the word of, word of God. There's no debate about what was and was not in the canon. So from the very beginning of Christianity, we have uh, Christians, early followers of Jesus, adopting the Jewish scriptures, the 39 books that we now have in our Old Testament. That was pretty much settled by that time. So how about the New Testament? We've got 27 books or letters. We've got four gospels, uh, 13 letters written by Paul, and then a handful uh, written by other authors for different purposes. 
So the question here is, how did these books and only these books make it into our New Testament? Uh, if you remember the book written by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, that kind of made waves a couple decades ago, right? Uh, he popularized a theory in his book that essentially uh, the New Testament was a process of a bunch of powerful religious men getting together under the authority of Emperor Constantine in the year 325 AD uh, to choose which books should be in the New Testament for the purpose of manipulating people, okay? Nearly 300 years after Jesus, choosing the books in order to control what people thought. So how true is this? Let's start with how Christians from the very beginning viewed the words of the New Testament. So uh, first, it should be said this, that the New Testament authors were very aware that what they were writing was not just chit-chat, it was not personal opinion, but what they were writing was from God. They thought themselves, they, they thought that themselves. So you have Paul uh, saying, what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. You have Peter right here in the letter of 2 Peter saying, uh, by the way, uh, this is a great line where he says, some, some things that Paul write, uh, writes are kind of hard to understand, which should be like really comforting to us. But then he says, some people twist his words as they do the other words of scripture. And so Peter is putting the writings of Paul in the same body of scripture. Okay? Uh, just as we read in this passage today, Peter himself says, we too have the prophetic message, which is completely reliable because we are eyewitnesses. So we, from the very beginning, have these writings being passed around the churches and being treated as scripture because the original authors said they're scripture. But then the apostles, the people who walked with Jesus, they died, and other people continued to write things about the life of Jesus and about what Christians should and shouldn't do. And so the question emerged, well, should these writings be also included in the canon of Scripture? Like, what do we make of this? And if they are or are not, then, like, how do we decide that? What's the criteria? And what emerged from this conversation was about a century-long dialogue between early church leaders about what is the criteria for determining whether or not something belonged in the canon of Scripture for the New Testament. And here's the criteria that emerged. There's four pieces. The first is apostolicity. This is the question, was the author of this piece either an apostle or closely connected to an apostle? The second is antiquity. This is the question, is this so old that what happened in these writings could be corroborated by eyewitnesses, people who lived and saw these things for themselves? Third is universality. This is the question, was this piece of literature widely accepted amongst Christians from the very start and not just a fringe group on the side? Because there's a lot of those. And fourth and finally, orthodoxy. This is, does the writing and the content of this writing map onto other pieces that we already have in the canon of Scripture. Using this criteria, the early church recognized the 27 books that we have in our New Testament. Now, I use this word recognition intentionally because what the New Testament or the early church was doing is recognizing something as Scripture. They were not making something into Scripture. Important difference. So if you were to put an animal in front of me and say, what is this animal? And I see that it's tiny and that it has six legs and wings... What am I going to call it? An insect. That's right. Now, me calling it an insect does not make that thing an insect. I, I am just recognizing what that thing is because it bears the marks or features of an insect. Does that make sense? This is what the New Testament or the early church was doing. So that Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, that Dan Brown famously said was a conspiracy to create the New Testament was really no such thing. The only reason that council was important is because it was an early point in history where all 27 books of the New Testament were compiled and listed in the same place. That's why that date is so important. But that does not mean that they were creating the New Testament. They were rather recognizing something that was already in existence and accepted. So, in short, what we see the Spirit of God doing is inspiring a new wave of Scripture 2,000 years ago through people who walked with Jesus and then we see the Spirit empowering people who were followers of Jesus shortly after to recognize that God had spoken and to collect these writings and include them in the body of Scripture. So we actually have really good reason to believe that what we have in the Bible truly belongs there. Okay, that was a lot. 
You guys did great, okay? That was our sort of like intro class to the creation, copy, and canon of uh, the Bible. Now, some of you are like, I never want to hear about this again. Thank you very much. Uh, others of you are like, I'm hungry for more. Okay, so if you want to dive deeper, uh, we put together a webpage of some resources. You can go to bridge.tv slash what is the Bible. And we've got some articles, podcasts, and books, depending on your, uh, how you'd like to take in information. And uh, you can pick and choose. Uh, and I, I'd say if you want a place to start, there is a Bible project series, podcast series called Paradigm, which is great. It's got like 12 parts. You can kind of pick and choose which ones you're interested in uh, and take a deeper dive there. But here's, here's how I want to wrap up. As we wrap up our time together, I want you to see this, that God has been faithful. That God has been faithful to speak, to give us scripture, and not only to give us scripture, but to preserve it through the faithful work of humans throughout the centuries, which means that you and I, we don't have to approach our Bible like this, that we can actually trust the Bible that we have been given. And so when you're going through tough times and you're looking for help, you can trust your Bible. When you are questioning and uncertain, you can trust your Bible. When you are looking to hear God's voice, you can trust your Bible. When you're looking for a word of encouragement and hope, you can trust your Bible. When you're looking to encounter Jesus, you can trust your Bible. And ultimately we believe in the word on the page because we believe in the word who became flesh. Amen. Yes. Andrew Wilson puts it this way. He says, our trust in the Bible stems from our trust in Jesus Christ. I don't trust in Jesus because I trust in the Bible. I trust in the Bible because I trust in Jesus. I love him and I've decided to follow him. So if he talks and acts as if the Bible is trustworthy, authoritative, good, helpful, and powerful, I will too. Even if some of my questions remain unanswered or my answers remain unpopular. That's a great line. The Bible is beautiful. The Bible is beautiful, and it's beautiful because it points to the one we call beautiful, Jesus Christ. And Jesus is coming back. Peter says it this way in our passage. He says, you will do well to pay attention to scripture as to a light shining in a dark place until a day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter's talking about the return of Jesus because he will return. And there is coming a day where we actually no longer need scripture because Jesus will be right here with us face to face. And that's a beautiful hope. But until that day, until that day, friends, we would do well to see scripture for the miracle that it is. And and may we trust in the one that it points to, Jesus, the one who was the word on the page, but who leapt off the page and into our very lives so that our lives might be changed forever. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at Bridge Church TN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.